How can we look at really small stuff? Like, so small that you can't see it with your naked eye. Well, people invented microscopes for that reason, and most of them are based on either visible light or some other ends of electromagnetic spectrum. One day, someone decided to use neutrons for that. Like, how can you use neutrons? They don't have a charge to interact with all the electrons and protons that make up everything around us. And we need this interaction to see anything on a nanoscale. Like, imagine that you're playing pool and trying to hit the cue ball. You aim at the triangle setup and want to see where the other balls go. When the cue ball hits the other ones, it is because on the atomic level they all have charges that repel each other. This doesn't work, however, for neutrons. But still, they are somehow used in neutron scattering and diffraction processes and help us see the nano world. Well, let's see how it happens. To begin with, we need a source of neutrons. And how do we get neutrons? Let's make a setup for our experiment. The most popular sources include research reactors and something called spallation, which practically means just smashing things together. The research reactors use nuclear fission, like in those big guys, but they do not generate power. And yes, they use enriched uranium for the process, so be careful. As for the spallation, it is pretty much like any other particle accelerator. We got a proton, speed it up, smash it against, uh, let's say, a bunch of tungsten, and BAM! We got neutrons flying in all directions. Who doesn't like explosions, right? It turns out these neutrons are too fast to be used for anything. Plus, they are flying in every direction, so no good. Let's put, say, a tank of liquid nitrogen in their way to slow them down to something decent. This thing is called a moderator, by the way. Now we have a preferred direction where we can put our instruments around the moderators and shield everything else. But we still have a problem with neutrons, since they don't have a charge. Hmm... Well, they might not have a charge, but they have a spin. And that means they can interact with magnetic field. So, if a neutron is flying near a nucleus, it can flip or switch the spin of another particle inside. The other interactions include two fundamental forces, the strong and the weak ones. We can imagine them through nuclear fission and fusion. Fission happens, for example, in those research reactors when a nucleus of uranium decays into lighter elements. And fusion is when a neutron hits a nucleus and decides to stay around. Of course, this way you might have a bunch of different particles and elements after the reaction. And some of them have different Greek letters and fancy names. There are also gamma rays. What's important here is that there can be elastic and inelastic interactions, like in classical mechanics. Elastic scattering is pretty much neutron diffraction, and it happens like in an example of billiard boards balls before. The starting momentum does not change magnitude, but changes direction. We begin with the neutron source, either through research reactor or spallation. Slow down the neutrons with the mediator, and in this way we select a specific direction. Then we place our sample. Lastly, at the end of Neutron's journey, they reach the detector, probably some kind of uh, image plate camera. At this time, a scientist by the computer sees something like that. Most of this is just noise from all the neutrons that went in this direction, but as with other diffractions, there are bragg peaks here. 
This way, having some references in years of experience, one can deduce the molecular structure of the sample. One big advantage here is that neutrons tend to leave the organic molecules alone and don't mess up the sample like some other highly energetic techniques. Let's better take a closer look at those spin interactions. Since neutrons don't have charge, they can get quite deep inside the bulk of the material before hitting anything else. This is of course because the size of a nucleus is around 100,000 times smaller than the size of the atoms. Now when a neutron comes into contact with a nucleus, both their spins change and this change remains in the sample. These scattered neutrons don't add any more Bragg peaks. Now let's look at our setup this time. Like in many other cases with different orientations, we will be using a polarizer at the beginning to set a specific direction. This time it will be a direction of spins. So we have a neutron source, a polarizer, then we place our sample and another polarizer to analyze the spin direction in the end. This time a scientist by the computer will be able to get information about magnetic properties of the material. For example, this can be phase transitions or other transition mechanisms, electron spin fluctuations and so on. Neutrons scattering today might not be the most popular way of looking at atoms and molecules, but it is still interesting. Many scientists still use neutrons when they are trying to understand some new phenomenon on fragile organic material or when there is need to look at magnetic properties of sample. And there is always so much more that is yet unknown.